Esther is just getting in. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Stephen Caruso, our tech tech guru for the uh, Columbus Free Press Salon, monthly free, uh, salon. October is uh, has become our traditional annual uh, award uh, um, night, and and it is this year as well. So um, we are happy, happy, happy to uh, introduce our uh, Libby Gregory Award and and the award winner for this year and we'll do that as we go forward we're going to have uh, suzanne sort of describe what the award is you know who was libby gregory some folks don't even know who that that person was we do we're intimate with her we loved her um but uh so then we'll have winnie winnie uh worth who who knows us hi esther i see you i see your smiling face hey 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 <laughs> Um, so we're going to have uh, Winnie introduce you, and then you go to town uh, uh, how you want to speak and do what you want to do for however long you want to, okay? Because you're you're the queen of the day, okay? So, well, let's not go royalty. I'm I'm not very royalty, so you're the important person of the day. Okay. All right. Um, but everybody wants to talk queens nowadays. Um, but. And I, I sort of think we, we, we beat back the revolution for a reason. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, no, I don't know. No, Esther was a queen in the Hebrew scriptures, and that's part All right. All right. So, um, Suzanne, are you ready to go? We're, we're going to yes. start the October um, salon. We have quite a few people tonight, so we're going to keep things, you know, running pretty tight. I'm sorry. But Esther's got full reign today, so it's her night. She can do what she wants to do. All right. So, um, but we have also uh, Jessica Stein, who's been one of the organizers and invited Esther to the the uh, big big rally that we had uh, on the state house steps. Uh, she was one of the organizers of that action. So we wanted to bring her in to sort. Of, and I'd seen her down at the state house several times um, with the S. SB 123 and that that's another issue that we need to deal with in Ohio so um, she'll talk a little bit um, then we have the uh, coalition on the uh, Immokalee workers uh, 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 Jordan Lake will be speaking in a little bit later on uh, updating they're wanting to do some education um, in and around Central Ohio on what the campaign is and where that's at at this point so Jordan will keep us up on that she'll she'll keep us up on that and then um, finally, uh, Nevin Siders is coming in from Mexico. I mean, Mexico, there's some major things going on. He's going to update us on uh, the EZLN's uh, work in Chiapas, uh, the Oaxaca uh, seven year ago uh, disappearance of students. Um, and I'll let him introduce all that. And also the most current uh, update in Mexico is that the parliament in Mexico is going the right direction and we're going the wrong damn direction in Ohio. So how can we do something and talk about this as an international discussion? So uh, Suzanne, please, uh, please introduce the Libby Gregory Award and then Winnie, you can introduce Esther and then Esther, please go forward. Welcome everybody. Thank you, Mark Stansberry. And I'm here with Bob Patrickus. It's kind of hard to, for us to both get on the screen at the same time. But um, so here we are uh, a year after the pandemic, more than a year after the pandemic, and we're still making sure that we give away our, our annual award for community activism that we've been doing since, I wanna say 1998. However, the very first one was in 1991 and it's named after Libby Gregory. And I have to admit Libby is not somebody that I ever met but Libby was uh, one of the editors of the free press back in its very, very early days in the seventies and the eighties. And she was like, um, I guess part of like this collective of people kind of like the way it is now, though it wasn't a nonprofit back then that gathered on OSU campus in response to the Kent State killings uh, back in 1970 started up the newspaper, the free press that for a while she was the editor and really turned it a, into a direction that, um, that it kind of remains now, which is a very feminist, very radical kind of militant direction when it comes to politics and social issues and fighting against war and for um, a lot of, you know, 
different causes, feminism being one of her big causes. So having never met her, I do, I did have to, uh, I do over the years have looked up things about her. And I also knew at the time, even though I never met her, that she was the owner of three of the very iconic establishments around campus, one of them being Trade Winds that doesn't exist anymore. That was a big, I don't know, it's kind of like a hippie shop. I don't know if any of you guys ever went there that you could describe it better. Um, had clothes and, and different type of probably bongs, I'm not really sure. And, uh, and she also was an entrepreneur in that she started up the very first vegetarian restaurant in Columbus, which was called the King Avenue Coffee House. Did somebody have a comment there? If so, I can't hear it, sorry. And that was on King, like King and Neil. And then right next to it, she started up a bead shop called Byzantium that actually existed all the way up until this century pretty recently. However, the reason that we named our award, the Libby Award, and we started up our awards ceremony and giving out a community award, community activism award in 1991 is because that's the year that Libby unfortunately passed away and it was a, an airplane accident in Southern California, very often blamed on Reagan for breaking up the um, air traffic controllers union at the time. And her plane was on the ground and another plane landed on top of it. And she was in, in the plane with one of her Byzantium employees as well. So it was a tragic event. She, it was very bad for our community to have lost Libby, but we've tried to keep her spirit going. And uh, there is a couple of books out there that have a history of the free press in them. We have a few copies of one here. It's called Blacklisted News. And I'll put a link to that online. And there's another one called The Insider's History of Vietnam Era Underground Press. And both of those talk about Libby in the history of the free press, if anybody's interested in knowing more. And I just wanted to say that uh, I'm happy Gary and Winnie are here. They've been longtime free press, uh, involved people, both of them on the board, Gary in the past, Winnie now, and we've worked with them for many years and they've made food for our, salon, for our award ceremonies in the past and gotten award, awards from us in the past. And I did wanna say as well, Esther, while you're talking, I could bring up the article that I just posted with all the pictures that you sent me, and those could be bring, coming up on the screen. I'm not sure how that could work. Maybe Steve, you could let me know if I could share a screen possibly a little while with Esther's talking, if I would be describing anything that you're talking about, Esther. So that's an option. And you're a host, so you, you can share a screen anytime. Okay. So she can let me know because she knows what picture she sent me. <laughs> and we also have a picture of us giving the award to Esther. So maybe a little bit, Winnie, while you're talking, I'll bring up some of those pictures if that's okay. And I just want to let everybody else know that's at the salon. If there's anything you want the whole group to know, please put it in the chat because that's what I go by the next day when I put together the after the salon email. I look at all the different announcements and information people put in the chat and I put it together in a big email and send it out to everybody and also post it on the free press. So uh, take it away, Winnie. Okay, Suzanne, if you could put a link to um, my article about Esther and Esther's article about herself that are in the free Columbus Free Press, that would be great. So Esther Flores is a registered nurse who started a harm reduction program in 2016 through her nonprofit One Divine Line to Health. Um, she supports the women who are on the streets of Columbus because of sex trafficking, addiction, or domestic violence. She calls these women the street sisters. <clears throat> now harm redu reduction means the bottom line of keeping people on the street alive by offering such things as food, condoms, Nar Narcan, winter coats, and much needed wound care. In six short years, she's built this baby up to uh, include a drop-in center on Sullivan Avenue, open five days a week where the street sisters can get a hot meal, um, a shower, clean clothes, also safe houses in Linden and the Hilltop, a community garden with activities for the children of the street sisters, she also does street outreach two to three nights a week out of her van. And her goal is to have these facilities in all four corners of, of Columbus. 
Esther Flores gets results. She has built this, um, she's out there in the trenches day in and day out, wearing her signature bandana and Converse arm star, all stars, and armed with unflagging focus, enthusiasm, and hope. She is solution driven. She emphasizes positive actions and the possibility of change rather than the sad stories of victimhood. Her motto is love heals the sick and love heals the world. She believes love is transformational and that is why her motif is the butterfly, the symbol of transformation and new life. That is why her van is decorated with butterflies and inspirational words, why the street sisters call it the love bug, and why Woman Warrior is written all across the windshield. Don't, but don't be fooled. Esther's work is not merely charity, which keeps the poor alive, but is at heart a Band-Aid on the economic inequality that's creating the pro problem. Her work is also work for justice, actually changing the causes and conditions that create the problem. For instance, just last week, she told, I mean, just this week, she told me that she has a new plan to start um, re-entry houses with, with supervision 24 seven to keep those who are released from incarceration or addiction from ending up back in the street. Now that is proactive, stopping the problem from happening. But her work is also work for justice because she speaks truth to power. What Esther says over and over, the street sisters are not prostitutes. They are women who have not been loved enough. And I um, thought that was sort of strange when I first heard it, but through the year, um, but now I believe that that is true. It is the lack of empathy for the humanity um, that for their humanity that's the root of the suffering on Sullivan uh, in our public policy. But by her persistence, Esther has garnered the support of several members of city council, the health commissioner of Franklin County, Columbus's health department, primary ones, health care for the homeless, as well as police officers on Sullivan Avenue, one who is on her board. That is effective activism. That is public education. That is opening hearts and blind eyes. The secret weapon of Esther's resilience is her Christian love. She believes love is a verb. And like her namesake in the Hebrew scriptures, Queen Esther, Esther is saving her people with the emphasis on her people. Those are, they are not those people. They are her people. And those people are our people. Those are our neighborhoods whose streets our streets, whose tax dollars are tax dollars. <laughs> so I'd like to urge the free press community to go beyond the performative action of giving a plaque. Go to One Divine Line to Health website, see the volunteer activities, go to Costco, pick up a case of soft, sweet granola bars, cook a hot casserole for the drop-in center meal one night, click on that donate button. All this information and more are on Columbus's Free Press website in an article I wrote, as well as on One Divine Line to Health. And so now we go to Love Warrior, Esther Flores. Everybody's muted, so you can't hear the clapping. You're muted. You're muted. corner can everybody hear me now yeah. okay <laughs> uh i don't know what to say it's not about me um in this life it's about the people that we serve who are caught in the shadows and i want to thank everyone um at the free press um gary and winnie um they're close to heart they feed our folks, oh Lord, every week. Um, and finally, Gary got the opportunity to hear it from one of the girls. Because um, I'm like, who does this? Who cooks this good? And 
Um, he heard it. Um, so I think it's very important to see the humanity with the beautiful souls that I work with. It has been very challenging, um, friends, especially in the in the world of advocacy in our city. Um, it's not about yelling. It's not about going into these demonstrations and um, and just using their anger to just write things on poster boards and then go home and do nothing. And um, coming, you know, growing up in a city where diversity was a part of life, coming here was just very different. I've been here for about 25 years. I'm a transplant from New York City. So I grew up between the Bronx and um, the Spanish Harlem, raised by a single mom. She raised two of us. And the challenges that came with that exposed me to violence. Um, part of the reason that I was raised by um, my mom was that I grew up in an environment where mom and dad fought. And October is actually the domestic violence awareness. So I would encourage everyone on the 23rd to um, attend a rally, a peaceful demonstration, I'm going to say, on domestic violence because Domestic violence is not only in the house, it is on our streets, it is on the alleys, it is everywhere. And unfortunately, sometimes people think that domestic violence is between a couple. Um, sometimes the children are being violate, violated. My mom struggles with mental health issue. Actually this week, she was admitted to the psychiatric ward in one of the um, psychiatric hospitals, um, working with that. Um, so I feel comfortable in, in, in sharing this with you because mental health issues is personal. Um, my mom could have been one of the women on, on the streets. And this is what I see. A lot of the women on our streets have children. They are engaged in survival sex because they're bringing the bacon to the table. Why is this happening if this is America? The challenges that we face in our city is, is that we see all these buildings, new buildings, and supposedly they're creating what is called affordable housing. And affordable housing, we know, is unaffordable. So those are challenges that, that we see. And for me, it's personal because I grew up with a mom who relied on public assistance. And I was just talking to a friend earlier today. I do not eat cornflakes anymore. Cornflakes was something that I ate three times a day. So at an early age, I learned how to pack bags because I knew I could make some money and I could come home. And I says, Ma, here's some chicken. <laughs> here's some juice. You know, here is some potatoes. Here's some rice please feed us. And it's interesting because at my age right now, I'm working with children. It's not only the women um, who are caught in the life of sex trafficking. I also work with children and single moms with many kids and they're struggling, especially COVID. The effects is still seen. Um, out on the streets, especially where I'm at, which is primarily on the West side. The families are still struggling. A lot of the women, um, the mothers lost their jobs um, because the kids were at home. And it's hard to have a job when you got five, seven, even 13 kids. Listen to this, 13 kids in the house. And you're supposed to be the teacher and you're also supposed to be bringing the bacon. So one good thing with the advocacy um, last year, the CARES Act, I was shocked because I've applied to grants in our city and in our county and I've been declined. And I personally feel it's because they see the women as prostitutes. They see them as drug addicts. They see them as people who don't care about themselves, who don't care about our city. That is a lie. Again, that is a lie. 
a lie, a lie, a lie. I have relationships with women who unfortunately have lost their lives to the opiate situation. And I have my own personal opinion about the substance abuse issues that we have here. But we all know, because if you are here and you're listening to this, you're an advocate. You already know that if someone is dependent on substance abuse, it's because they're trying to deal with a pain, all right? They're trying to deal with a pain. They feel that by taking crack, which is now laced with um, fentanyl, we call it fetty on the streets, they wanna take crack, and this is what people need to understand, there is now a shift from opiates to stimulants, crack, marijuana, LSD, all this stuff because they're afraid of heroin because heroin is no more black tar, the black tar. It's gray. We call it the brick because it's now laced with fentanyl. So now they're afraid if they take this heroin, which is laced with fentanyl, they're going to die. So they switch to the stimulants. And now the drug dealers, who are also pimps, um, I realized that, and the women have realized that, is that now the crack, the weed, and other stimulants have the, have the fentanyl. And they're like, why am I going through withdrawals? I am not doing heroin anymore. I'm not doing Betty anymore. Well, I did a test and they found out for themselves by urinating in a cup that not only the substance that they were taking, it has other contents in it. This is the reality. So we have two kinds of people in our city right now, those who hurt and those who don't hurt. And I wish, or I hope that those who don't hurt can actually support people like me who work with the hurting, especially at nighttime. We have no resources at nighttime. We become that lifeline to our folks. I think it's very important for us to understand that that person that you see out on, you know, on the streets, there is a story. Um, they're just not discard um, of society. I've lost many people this year. And right now, so that you are aware, we've served close to 2,200 right now of human trafficking victims. Um, we are counting now the guys. Um, they are men who are not gay. They are just engaged in survival sex so that they can feed their family. This is the reality of what we are um, facing in our city. And I feel that part of what we do is to, um, and, I, and I saw the, the post. Well, if you, there's somebody that posted and say marijuana is not seen as a stimulant. Well, clinically it is. And I know that people can use it for whatever they want. I'm just talking about the people that I'm working with. That's all. I'm not trying to get into a debate with that. We do have people that want to take, you know, the weed and that's what they go out on the streets. Remember, it's cheaper. And what happens is it's not pure. It's laced with other things. That's all I just want to say. I'm not trying to get into a debate with that. Um, our people are hurting and they're trying to self-medicate the emotional pain. My objective is to promote love. I believe love is a verb, it's transformational. I believe that if we work together, or you, one of my phrases is, is that in common unity with love, we save lives. And the people that we work with are homeless. And again, it's because affordable housing is unaffordable. They have mental health issues. And unfortunately, some of the issues that we're facing right now in access to recovery, it's very limited. Women have five kids. Who's going to take care of their kids? You see, these are things that people need to understand. Um, if we're advocating for women's rights, we also have to look at the transgender community. They are still placed anatomically. So they are being violated, not only in recovery, and those are experiences that I've had with um, the people that I'm serving, um, my family. It's also in the institutional setting, such as the jail. <laughs> so we have 
transgender folks being violated at Jackson Pike, you know? So it's kind of mind boggling when we have so many advocates in our city and they need to advocate for those who we see on our streets. And that is why I have a non-judgmental approach to the people that I love. Um, right now we have a serious, serious syphilis outbreak. Um, and we're having children born with congenital, listen to this, syphilis. So that's why I'm out there providing the oral condoms and the regular condoms. If anything that they need, I'm gonna try to get it from the health department because we need to save lives. It's treatable, it's a bacteria. And what we know is that the first two stages of syphilis is highly contagious. And a lot of times our women have open sores um, and they cuddle because it gets cold. They're in a trap house, body heats, keeps them warm. Well, if another woman has an open sore, the um, syphilis gets uh, on her skin, she's gonna end up with it. So there's a lot of stuff that, that, that is happening in our city and as a clinician in good standings as a registered nurse, I'm just trying to do what I can to reduce the harm. And I have become more of a harm reduction specialist. I personally can hand out the syringes and the cookery. Um, I'm part of the Franklin County Addiction Plan. So I have other contacts that provide me with the stuff. So I would have a volunteer, um, someone who is trained um, in our team to hand that out. So what happens is they give me the dirty syringes um, and we give them the cookery and which has a syringe and it also has some information. A lot of the things that, that I've been exposed to in our city is just trying to deal with the issues that are in the hearts. And part of what we need is having the professionals um, to, to, to go ahead and meet the people where they're at. And that is lacking. Um, most of the time, you know, everyone expects the patient or the client to go to the provider. Well, again, our people have no cars, no salaries. So maybe we should change the model a little bit. So everybody knows in the Franklin County Addiction Plan that the highest rate of overdoses is between 5 p.m. and 5 a.m. So why don't we have services available at that time? That's just a simple question. So a lot of the things that I believe are simple, which I would say is common sense, man, it's complicated here in our system because our systems literally have become the cowboys and the people that are ser that are that I'm serving are the Indians they're being victimized yeah. they will go ahead and give them emergency listen to this emergency health care because the system's not we're gonna go ahead and milk it and then next thing you know they're there for three weeks six weeks they get paid and guess what? They had enough time to try to find a place for the person to live because remember they came in homeless and what do they do they discharge them with a homeless status and where do they come to they come to their familiar setting because their brain is programmed to do the familiar things this is why it is so difficult to see these beautiful souls who have a heartbeat to receive the help. And then you got a big mouth like me trying to tell the system, can we work together? Can you see that drop-in centers work? Believe it or not, it took me a long time. I couldn't wait for the city. I could not wait for the state because there were senators that knew about my program and I was out there, you know, sending them emails. You know, um, sometimes I voted for them and sometimes I didn't vote for them. Long story short, the community came in and we were able to get that place renovated and open on January. It's been an eye-opening experience. And I've heard a lot of stories and I'm the first one to, to believe that we should not be locking up our girls and we have a new police and I'm still trying to pray so I can meet up with her 
because I've sent her emails, I've left her messages, and still, and I met with her personally two weeks ago, still haven't heard from her, but we need some change. Incarceration is not rehabilitation. We need to understand that a lot of the programs that, that are out there are not accessible to our people, and it takes a community like us of advocates to go ahead and go against the status quo and help the people. I'm all about the transitional housing, but my situation right now is with so many women who are struggling with, um, with, with, with the substance abuse disorder because it is a mental health issue, then we need to look at safe places. I am the first one who would say, if a person is struggling in Linden, I'm not going to bring them back to my Linden house. I'm going to go ahead and take them to the east side or the south end, far away from the environment, because it is the environment, um, especially where we're at. We're in the hot zone in the street. We are in the hot zone. Those are the pay those are the places that we have the highest amount of violence. We have the highest amount of, um, you know, drug activity um, with the violence. We have the highest murder rate. I'm now, you know, 40 hours a week at the drop in center. I have, I'm, I think I'm back in New York City when I grew up. So many sirens. It's not only the police sirens, it's also the fire engines. Yep. We also have the helicopters. You know what? Actually, right above the drop in center. Um, this week, we had two houses within walking distance because we're located on, on Central Hilltop. Night came and boarded them. But this is the reality. They'll board them and then they'll board them up and then they go somewhere else. We have about 40 to 60, listen to this, dope houses in our neighborhood. This has to stop. Maybe if the community has some love, okay, then they will police them. You, they're talking about, oh, we don't need police. Well, I have my own opinion. That's too much money. Our CPD is receiving too much money. They need to take half of that money and give it to people like my like myself that dope men and um yeah mostly dope men that I that I work with I know that there's some dope girls but I primarily work with the dope men they respect me you see we have other anti violence um organizations that are at the grassroots um level we are respected we can make the difference we need to protect our children we need to protect our women we need to protect our transgender folks and let them know, you know what? You are somebody. The officials may think that you're nobody, but you are somebody and I'm gonna do what I can to protect you. I believe that in order for us to continue to fight the good fight of love, to transform our communities, first it starts in your house. It starts in your household. And if it starts in your household, then you're gonna protect your little ones and you're gonna be the positive influence so that those little ones, when they go out to the schools and when they're out there, they're going to be seeing everybody as a human being and they're going to protect their human being. Because when I faced my mortality a few months ago, I wanted to bust out the cap of those two men because they were about to take that young girl. All right. And she was the love bug became the shield. OK, I had my taser. I had my pepper spray. I had my knife. I was ready to go out and beat the crap out of him. And I'm a nonviolent person. But the way he treated her, the only thing I, I that came out of my mind was, do you understand who she is? As long as she's in my presence, you're going to treat her as a human being because she is a child of God. That's exactly what I said. We are all God's children. He believed in diversity. And if we are a heterogeneous race, then we need to also protect those most vulnerable. And let me give you a heads up. That, that gun, he had a beam and I saw it on me and I'm like, Lord, I'm ready to go. But obviously I'm here. Because you know what? I pray sometimes and I say, Lord, if I'm going to go, I'm not going to be like Jesus. I'm not going to say, oh, go ahead and beat the hell out of me. I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight and I'm going to make sure that every blood, every blood that is dripped, if I'm going to die that way in violence, it's just going to call out and it's going to say, love, 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 love. 
We are a community trying to protect the most vulnerable. I'm glad that we have some leaders, not all leaders, okay? Especially on the West Side, it's hard. I haven't been able to even communicate with these folks. And I'm sure they're going to be popping out of their closets and out of their homes right now because next month, you know, we're, we're supposed to be voting for, for some of these leaders. But it is difficult to rely on some of our leaders. But what we can do is we can be leaders within our community and save the lives. That's all the message that I have to say. I really appreciate, you know, the fact that, um, you know, um, this paper allows me to express myself. And I really love working with Suzanne. Um, not only as editing the material is because sometimes it's hard for me to communicate um, because I'm judged. I'm judged by how I look. I'm not trying to wear a bandana. Right now, I want to wear the bandana because I have so much gray hair. But the bandana is just a signature. Um, it's just a signature um, for my um, for, for them because a lot of times they don't remember my name because it's the part of the brain that's affected, but they like color. It's the creative part of the brain where trauma also affects. So they remember in the jails and in the prisons, um, uh, you know, that girl on the bandana that gave me that brown bag of food, you know, that gave me that sweater. Um, and right now there's so much stuff happening in our city and believe it or not, our numbers are getting better. So I think that we need to find it in our hearts that we do have the capability of transforming a person's life, a person's life, if you provide the basic needs, and that's what we do. And lastly, I want to say again, this month is the Domestic Violence Month. Um, we deal with domestic violence, and that's an issue that I have right now because, um, especially, I'm going to be honest. You know, places like Choices, they don't see the human trafficking victims as domestic violence. Um, uh, folks they are if a sugar daddy beats the crap out of her that's intimate partner violence okay if she's relying on a pimp um for years that's still and he beats the crap out of her you know um with, with the um with the gun that's still intimate violence um uh, partner violence that's the domestic violence the statistics are alarming it says 20 people per minute are victimized you hear that? With domestic violence. 20,000 calls a year in the United States are made to the domestic violence hotline. Homicides, 20% of the homicides. You know who gets killed? Family members, um, neighbors, first responders. It's a hostile environment when domestic violence is taking place. One out of 15 kids try to intervene in the situation they've witnessed. You see that? The violence. You know what that turns out to be? 90% of the cases where children are involved in domestic violence, they see it. So you imagine, I saw it for myself. It affects us. So I think sometimes we need to understand that we can give justice and be justice through our advocacy. Stop looking for it. You are the justice cause. And we already know Martin Luther King said it all. And I love that boy. He, um, that man, I should say he was not a boy. He was a man, a real great man um, who loved God. Um, and he says injustice everywhere. Injustice every, um, everywhere is a threat to justice anywhere. So be the change, be love, be justice, and we will see lives transformed through the power of love be that's all divine. be one divine be one divine be one divine. one divine line to hell yes one dl2h that one esther i'd like don't get off yet i want to bring in jessica in because she invited you to the big action and i wanted you guys to sort of talk about what what did you think was going to come out of that action i i'm that's a native that's a naive question but um <laughs> Senate Bill 123. So, Stephen, if you could get them sidebarred up, Jessica Stein and, and Esther, that'd be great. And in the meantime, in the meantime, I'm showing some of the pictures uh, of her I love bug and the, the love bug, the <laughs> drop in center. Yeah, yeah. And the community garden that you didn't mention, Esther, with the butterfly garden for kids. 
Oh yeah, the camping in the hood. That was a hostile situation when we started that. And we've had it for four years. We couldn't do it last year. So our kids don't have the ability to go and camp, um, real camping. Um, and it's really nice because they have tents, they have sleeping bags, we provide them, we feed the kids. So we invite the cops, we do that. Um, the fire department, we have entertainment. We have, you know, sometimes we have a clown or um, we always have like a tattoo artist, um, you know, balloon maker. I mean, they're, most of our kids are ADD. So we have everything from 10 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night time is 24 hours of fun. So it was kind of nice to do it this year, but we had less kids this year because of the whole COVID thing. We were still practicing. And we usually have about 25 to 27 kids to participate this year. We had about, I think 17 kids participate. That's still good. Hey, uh, I love the fact that we need to advocate for a 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. thing. So mm -hmm. Jessica's on with us now. And and remember what we just said, 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. services, mm -hmm. direct services. That, that in a way, blows my mind, sort of, is that, yeah, the city doesn't have that. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's sort of like that simple, that simple, that simple answer is, mm -hmm. yeah. So Jessica, we brought you in a little bit to sort of talk about SB. Two, three, one, two, three, which we hate. And um, I also wrote like a little thing for please, Esther, if it's I, okay, if I read that, because I do please, dance. Please, yeah. And then Esther, so, and I would like you and Esther sort of get in a conversation of why you invited her and how she felt about you being invited uh, to that big action. That was a great action. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's uh, so in a society where we demonize and objectify sex workers, Esther chose to choose kindness and empathy and a white mm -hmm. patriarchal society where we are told that people who don't follow societal norms are undeserving of basic human decency. Esther chose not only to humanize these people, but to love them. She chose to show up for the people who no one shows up for. She chose to respect and listen to them despite what society says, despite them being shunned, not only by men, but by society as a whole, and that includes some feminist circles, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Esther chose to show up for them when most choose to pretend that they don't exist. In the club, we all hear about what an angel she is and how she shows up every day with kindness. Even though we aren't on the streets, we know her name. We know the kindness she possesses and the holiness and sanctity that she believes all life has and above all her power. So today I'd like to thank Esther for seeing the value that sex workers possess despite what society tells her. And I'd like her, I'd like to thank her for seeing us as what we are, human beings and not just uh, objects. So. Love you, thank Jess. Thank you, Esther. Yeah, love I know. You. I love you too, babe, because this is a, and it's, I'm, and I, and I know that some women don't like to be called babe. I, in my mind. I don't care. Okay, it's I Spanish. I, I'm complicated because mm -hmm. my mind sometimes I'm translating. Um, mm -hmm. And when I say Bebo in Spanish, it's not condescending mm -hmm. or anything. It's words of endearment. Uh -huh. um, it, and it's a challenge because of what society labels women. And I'm tired that our women, some, you see, they say, oh, they have a choice. No, they don't have a choice. Okay, because mm -hmm. their body, becomes a commodity because it's life-saving. That's what they say, okay? It's survival. It is they survival. don't understand that. They don't understand that. And I feel like people um, like you, and I know that, you know, I, I have talked to some of our um, leaders and I'm like, you just don't mm -hmm. get it. And I think reproductive um, injustice is so real here because of the lack of access to our transgender community. Like last year, I can name, and I don't, they receive, these organizations receive so many funding. And you know what? Our folks, especially, you know, the transgender community, and we're talking about the trans women, they are at risk for HIV, you know, hepatitis C, you know, because, you know, of oh, their yeah. sexual practices. Imagine. And especially when you factor in everything else, like if they're a woman of color, yes. if they're a black woman, Absolutely. and even trans men, like they're othered constantly. And like sex yes. workers are already othered, but then you mm -hmm. add in those factors. And that's why it's so important to be intersectional with everything and very um, open-minded and 100%. listen to people. And that's what frustrates me about um, white-centered feminism is like, 
instead of being like, oh no, you hurt my feelings and that wasn't my intention. It's like, listen, yes. because effects are more important than what your intentions were. Listen, uplift yes, and support. And it's very frustrating because it's like, you can't leave a whole group of people out. And especially because they're the most marginalized people. Yep. So it's like, you have to take care of them. Those are our sisters. It's not sister CIS, it's sister, yeah. period. <laughs> yes, and the problem for, for them is the access to the resources. So you imagine they needed condoms because you know what? Just because we were, you know, that we had a shutdown, that didn't mean that sex stopped. Am I right? Sex right. continue. Okay. Right, and they and still have to eat. They, they have, still to, have eat. to eat. And, and, you, and unfortunately, we had Johns that were disgusting. They were nasty. They were raw. Mm -hmm. You know, they were like, no, I don't want you to do anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm being real with everyone here because they knew they were desperate. And guess what? Some of our women and transgender folks, okay, mm -hmm. took the bait. So if it wasn't for the fact that I showed up there with the condoms and they said it, we, three years ago, we had an HIV outbreak okay like right now i'm panicking because the whole issue with congenital um syphilis these babies are being born with it their brain already we're gonna know if it infects the brain nor their neural um development is gonna be stunned they may even die okay because that mm -hmm. can kill you it's a bacteria but if a baby's born with it it's life threatening and that's another, yeah. And that's another reason they should have the right to choose whether they have another shot. Just like when you said they, the woman has 13 children. I have yeah. three children as a single mother. I couldn't mm -hmm. imagine 13. I yeah. couldn't imagine 13. And it's their choice. And the lack of access to any of this is so frustrating because if they really cared, if these policymakers really cared, they would invest in social programs, like what you're doing, after school mm -hmm. programs. They we see that they can feed people during this mm -hmm. pandemic. We've seen they can do that. They can send lunches, they can do that. But you know, you're funding police and our police are militarized and they can take yeah, helicopters to like put CPD in the air, but half Columbus schools don't have air conditioning. Yep. Why don't these babies have air conditioning when we don't have an ozone layer and then you're trying to strip women people with uteruses of their bodily autonomy and whether or not they become a parent when are we even sure this planet is sustainable enough for more people mm. for one and for two we're already struggling the poverty line there's a pandemic people don't want to wear masks we saw the pro-life mm -hmm. none yeah. of them had masks on they were instigating there with the you know and I want to give a shout out to the local organizers because on the 28th, they showed up and went into the Senate and I was there and that was awesome. I mean, mm -hmm. so great. And it was, um, it was amazing. Just like I like shout out to Columbus organizers because we really do work together and take care of each other and push. But I think that's something else is we have to keep showing up and staying angry because a lot of those people I worry are going to go home like, okay, I held a sign for three hours and that's it. I like. <laughs> But if you give up, then you're giving up on the people most marginalized. Because let's be real, the the upper class will still be able to have access to abortion and things like that. But it's people like the girls on the street and single mothers that will lose that access. Women of color, trans men, non-binary people, the people that are most marginalized by society. And that's what's scary is because it's not the people making these laws that it affects. Mm -hmm. and, and that's my biggest concern because I know this is going to be really strong, but I'm going to say, maybe I shouldn't say it. <laughs> um, I, I'm just not going to say it because if, <laughs> um, it, unfortunately, I, I'm just going to keep it this simple. People are capitalizing from human suffering. Just that's all. Oh, yes. Yeah. The, and what and did I've we seen see they made? Um, the one percent made what? What was it like for, for some number I'll never see in my life? Trillion, billion. Mm. They made so much money during this pandemic. They always yes. capitalize off our suffering, and yes. that's the problem. We need more people who are regular, everyday people who are empathetic and care to run for office. Yeah, who are not yeah. afraid to make waves, because that's the problem. We need to get 
younger kids out there to vote because unfortunately most of us don't vote unless it's a primary election like Mm -hmm. you need to vote in every election local state and federal not just one or the other like it's very important so it's frustrating because i'm mad all the time guys i'm sorry that this conversation is fantastic we need to keep it going as as much as we can and please write for the free press Please, please, both of them. <laughs> but I want to bring in, I want to bring in uh, Jordan Lake, who is uh, representing the Coalition for Immokalee Workers. And sex violence is very evident in the fields. Yes. Um, and uh, I just want to, and Steve, can you like uh, time her into this? Com- thank you. And I would like she to do a little presentation and then you guys do your conversation the three of you start talking please go ahead everyone i am so glad to be able to join you and catch a little bit of what you're talking about a little bit of this conversation i'm not able to stay on for super long but um i was talking i'm not either it's okay (laughs) i'm like but i could talk to esther forever you guys are all talking so long anyways no i'm teasing i'm teasing i'm teasing no it's great Good stuff, good stuff. Yeah, I've been so happy to catch um, a bit of this conversation. And Esther, it sounds like the work that you do is incredible. Um, and I'd love to you know, connect more with you all. I was in conversation with Tim about, so I'm, rep- I'm here representing uh, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers and the Alliance for Fair Food. The Coalition of Immokalee Workers is a uh, migrant farm worker organization based in Immokalee, Florida, which is in the Southwest of Florida. Um, and they basically began in the early 90s, uh, responding to the abhorrent conditions of farm workers in the fields of our agricultural system. And like Mark just mentioned, sexual violence uh, being a huge piece of that, uh, wage theft, physical and verbal abuse, uh, in worst cases, modern day slavery, which is something that we also litigate um, around in our work. Um, And I'm just basically here to make a little announcement that we, and the Alliance for Fair Food is the ally uh, organization of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. So we stand firm in that farm workers can only represent their struggle themselves. So the Coalition of Immokalee Workers is the farm worker organization that we work alongside and we are distinctly a separate entity um, to maintain them as such and leave them to be able to speak, organize and make decisions around um, the change that needs to happen in the agricultural system on their own. And then we as allies um, are in solidarity and alongside them in whatever they choose to do. But part of our organizing the coalition to briefly paint a picture of um, of what we've done is, oh, I see this um, this picture painting that's getting shown by Gary. I love it. Um, <laughs> but so the Coalition of Immokalee Workers basically created what's now called the Fair Food Program, which assures that uh, basic human rights are upheld in the fields and work uh, farm workers themselves are their own uh, frontline monitors of their human rights, where they're now able to make uh, complaints, report abuses without fear of retaliation. And part of this is possible because of market power that has been harm- harnessed by farm workers and allies together to bring large corporations into the program to hold corporations accountable for the abuse that's taking place in their supply chain. So. We've had many campaigns in the Campaign for Fair Food, which is what we call our efforts to bring these large corporations in. Our current campaign is against Wendy's, and we know that in Columbus, Wendy's is big, uh, hometown, pride. Um, But we've had a long campaign on OSU's campus trying to cut Wendy's contract with The Ohio State University, Um, a larger Wendy's boycott going on for over five years. Um, There's a long saga to the Wendy's campaign, and I'm about to link a few different resources for you all um, that you can check out so I don't take too much time here. But basically this fall we were originally going to go on tour and visit folks in Columbus, in San Francisco, where we have a separate branch of the Wendy's campaign going, and New York, where we have a, a different branch of the Wendy's campaign active. And with everything with COVID, it didn't feel responsible to, to actually travel, but we are now um, doing these tours virtually and we have an upcoming Columbus virtual tour from October 23rd to the 31st. So if you all are part of any organizations, community groups, as individuals want to connect um, and have some conversations around 
the farm worker struggle specifically and get looped into the organizing that's been happening in the Columbus area for the past few years that we're trying to revive after losing a lot of energy in COVID. Um, we would love to connect with any of you, do presentations, have conversations. Um, and that's mainly what I'm here just to, to plug is that from the 23rd to the 31st, we're gonna be focusing uh, squarely on Columbus and trying to connect with anyone who's really interested in creating more farm worker ally solidarity or worker to worker organization solidarity. Um, and I'm gonna put some links in the chat too to give a little bit more follow-up so if you all are interested, and it doesn't need to be um, exclusively during that week, but that's when we're going to be most focused on, um, on Columbus exclusively. Also, if nothing comes out or, you know, if we're not able to connect during the week that we're going to be virtually touring Columbus, we also have an upcoming week of action that folks can plug into um, November 15th through 21st, where we're going to have some virtual ways to take action to support farm workers during this you know, still very difficult time um, where they're left underprotected, underrepresented in terms of access to COVID resources, vaccines, testing, et cetera. So that's my short spiel. And I would love to just field any questions or, or hear from you all if you have anything. Uh, before we, before we open up too much, Esther is still on and, and uh, you know, she's uh, uh, involved with so many things and her perspective is is very is very strong in 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 uh justice in, ju in, in justice in general uh jordan you how long have you been working with uh ciw i've been involved with their work since 2018 but i've been a staff member uh well since 2019 so a little over two years yeah, fantastic fantastic so where where do you feel Esther? where where with this this discussion did you think uh a, a the problem is with this this campaign this particular campaign i'll tell you columbus is very virtual virtual uh it's it's very uh, we're we're done with virtual we want to mm -hmm. be in person so i'm thinking that's a challenge just mm -hmm. just off the bat so, but go ahead esther please share a little bit and jordan thank you for for sharing i've been with ciw i, I was with the the first march from uh Imokli into naples into the presbyterian church i was there when they they came in so it was i've been with ci uh the, the Imokli workers not ciw always but I, mm -hmm. I i support their work and and really welcome columbus as being the the sort of the, the the epicenter of the action right now so yeah please esther please if you have any comments the only thing i can say is is like um um i try to stay within um anything that i come in close to because i am a very busy person because a lot of the issues that i'm dealing with is constantly in crisis mode um late at night but this is not to say that especially on the west side we have a lot of immigrants um, and they're migrants. And I work with other advocates who actually feed the migrants, um, Southern, you know, the Southern part and actually locally. A lot of people don't understand that the reason why we have the vegetables and the fruits is because of migrant workers. Um, who's picking the fruits and the veggies and uh, it's being shipped to Kroger and other places. Um, you know, the eggs, you know, we've had scandals in the past, you know, with the egg um, industry here. Um, and the fact that some people are trafficked because of their skill sets, especially in the agricultural world. I come from a warm country, you know, an, an island, and that's what we are known for. But now it's become industrialized but we still need the veggies, we still need the fruits, and they are struggling. A lot of times they're living in um, apartments and there are a lot of people in it. Um, so I've had some of these advocates ask for help. So whenever I get milk or whenever I get food, I share it with the migrant workers. Um, so it's kind of like I'm passionate to talk about that. And I've seen it, I've worked with the children and we're talking about a lot of Hispanics and Jordan, you can correct me. They got big families. 
And now what we need to understand is, is that a lot of them are working. A lot of the men are, um, they, they may have an opportunity to do something else, but a farmer is a farmer. It's a natural thing. There's nothing wrong in their country to be a farmer. And then they come here thinking that they're going to have equal pay and have equal rights. And it is mind boggling that the land of the freedom is now becoming an oppressor to them by, again, not providing them with the basic needs. If you're going to work, you need to have access to a running toilet. Am I right, Jordan? Okay, no. they don't need an outhouse. Okay, this is why we've had some outbreaks with hepatitis A, which is fecal oral transmission. We wouldn't have to have that if they had running water and they could wash their hands. I mean, it's shocking with some of the stuff that I've seen here and what um, my friends who are in the advocacy world um, with the migrant workers. Um, and it frustrates me. Um, and the only thing that I can do is, is if I have access to resources, I'm all about sharing the resources to, um, with them, especially for the kids and the moms. Nevin had a question. Nevin, do you want to address Jordan? Yes, yeah, so, uh, Steve, we're going to get Nevin in okay. real quick. And he, he has a question, but I, with sort of it's a logical progression. We're going to bring in someone that's based in Mexico. And his, his question is how many uh, farm workers are uh, Mexican in Central mm -hmm. Ohio, in Ohio, whatever. Uh, because, you know, in Ohio, we have that 75, that 75 rush going up. 75 going up. Uh, I, that's going straight up to Michigan for the, the apples and everything else. 75 is strong. Columbus is not on 75. So it, we've traditionally been Central American and Puerto Rican uh, uh, influence. Uh, but lately we're starting to see more Mexican, Honduran, Central American uh, reality in, in Columbus. I'm just speaking Columbus because we're Columbus. Um, so how do we communicate those issues? Why? And Nevin is coming in. I, I want to bring Nevin into this. That's what I'm sort of. And, and Jordan, if you got to go, thank you so much. We will get something going on with CIW and the Alliance uh, for Fair Food. Uh, we'll have education between those, those days. Um, just keep keep in touch with Wendy and we'll we'll make it happen. Wendy Wendy is the central coordinator um, for CIW and Alliance for Food. So thank you if you got to go, but please join in if you want to as well. Uh, Nevin, we're going to bring in Nevin and Esther. Please stay in the conversation. You're you're not you're not you, sorry. You are an award winner, so we're going to make you work. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. If you got to go, you got to go. But. Um, Nevin, come on in and, and sort of talk about, we got him asking, there's three major issues we asked him to talk about. One is we just experienced the seventh year of an event that was about educators, young people being disappeared because they were starting to activate. Ayotzinapa, 23 students lost. We don't know where they're at and they're the, the we don't know what's going on. So that discussion is going to bring in a little bit. The EZLN, Zapatistas, started probably what, what was it, 2011-ish? It might even been even before then. I'm sorry. He's going to catch us up. I've been around with the Zapatistas forever, so I, I, I support them. You know, sub, they, the, what I like about them is they never say there's comandante. They're always subcomandante. <laughs> means, you know, they're not, they're not. Uh, they're not the boss, you know, they're not the boss, the people are the boss. Um, and then another that ties into what we're talking about tonight is the move in Mexican parliament to reduce or eliminate uh, reproductive rights ban. In Ohio, we're going towards the direction of eliminating women's health care. That's in the direction we're going. I mean, you can you can talk any way which you want to go, but the direction that they want to go, the people down there, those white motherfuckers. Excuse me, Stephen. I'm sorry, we're public. I'm sorry, but they are 
what I'm saying. I don't care, bleep it, whatever you want to do. They are not right. And they're trying to limit a women's, women's health care, uh, period. Okay, Nevin, please come on into this conversation. Jordan, if you got to go, thank you. We'll, we'll definitely work with you. Esther, please stay on for a little bit longer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I do have to hop off, but it was great to be in touch and definitely reach out if you want to stay in touch. We will, definitely, definitely. Thank Bye, y'all. Yep. Jordan, or ne uh, Nevin, please. And Nevin. Good evening. He is a Columbus, Ohio guy. You know, he may say he's in Mexico, but he, he's been in Ohio for a, a, a long time. He'll be back up here in November. So if we don't get to all your points, we're going to touch base a little bit more t uh, in November, December. You're in town in November, so maybe we can join in with the salon in November. But but please, jump on as much as you can. And, and we are getting a little long right now. It's 8.05. We're trying to get done by 8.30. Um, most of the time. And then there's informal conversations. This is a salon. So Stephen will keep on as long as we want and, and talk and let some other folks include. I'm sorry, we usually have more folks being able to in, 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 uh, involved in the in the conversation, but we sort of wanted to go thematic today. So go ahead, Nevin, please. Hello. Yes, I grew up in Columbus. I was born next door and <clears throat> I was born in Columbus and grew up most of, the, <clears throat> of my childhood in uh, Worthington. I have lived in now in Mexico half of my life uh, since I was 30. I'm now 60 and some. <clears throat> and yes, I will be visiting family next month. Uh, should I uh, begin with the topic of women's rights, Mark? Please. It's Please, since that, that'd be a nice uh, uh, segue. Thank you. I prepared some um, slides as a professor. That's uh, how I'm more comfortable presenting. So I'm going to share uh, oh, yeah, That's screen. right. I forgot to say, Nevin is a professor. So we're going to start getting a little bit more dry and a little bit more. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> and I assume you don't want to see my face so much. Um, so here I'm looking for the tool to share a screen. <clears throat> um, Mark asked me to speak about uh, how the right to choose has been extended it, here. Um, abortion was illegal throughout Latin America uh, until fairly recently. Um, Daniel se fue in the Ciudad de Mexico se permitió el aborto. About 10 years ago was the first time here in Mexico City, the local government decriminalized abortion. And uh, <clears throat> before that, uh, Nicaragua and Cuba were the only places where it, it had been decriminalized. Uh, now, this year's news, in fact, this month's news, is that <clears throat> uh, in June, two states of this country decriminalize abortion. Uh, there's the photo of the state government of Veracruz having its vote on July 19th. Um, the green kerchief is the uh, symbol of this movement throughout Latin America. When women march for their right to choose, they wear green kerchiefs. Uh, often around their throat, often over their face. <clears throat> and we can see here that not only women voted for the right to choose, men did too uh, in that small state government. That was actually the second state this year to do it. Hidalgo did just a little bit before. And on that same day, another state, Baja California, uh, voted again or did not approve decriminalizing abortion. Uh, why is this particularly important? Because uh, Oaxaca, where it has now been decriminalized, this procedure has been decriminalized for a couple of years, and Hidalgo are among the poorest states in the country and with the highest percentages of first peoples. Veracruz also has a fairly high percentage of proportion of indigenous peoples 
and is also one of the less affluent states. Um, the text of the law says that um, fairly rigorously translated by, my, by myself, uh, freed from criminal responsibility are abortions performed when a woman has been raped, when she has been involuntarily inseminated. I don't, I've never heard that included before, or when the life of either the woman or the fetus is in danger. The sponsor of the law, uh, Monica Robles, said that having it in our criminal codes, and when she proposed the law the day before in the state legislature, legislature of Veracruz, having this in our criminal code does not mean that women will stop having abortions, but rather women abort for many personal reasons. And if we knew their circumstances, we would not speak of criminalizing them, but rather protecting them, as Esther was saying so well, so clearly, so eloquently in her presentation. Felicidades, Esther. Esther, for su uh, noble labor. Gracias, compadre. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the next paragraph in the state law says that sanctions for voluntary abortions are given only after the first 12 weeks. In other words, the first 12 weeks, the first trimester has no sanctions at all. And they were reduced to a maximum of two months parole, uh, home uh, re-education mm -hmm, for second and third trimesters for the person who performs the abortion. The woman who received it has no sanctions ever at any time. However, it goes on that next paragraph to say for involuntary abortions, for someone who imposes it on women, it does sanctions are quite severe. Three to five years of jail uh, and quite uh, steep fines, which increase even more to six to 10 years of prison when, uh, well, when an abortion is performed involuntarily by physical or moral violence. Mm -hmm. So these laws protect women uh, quite clearly. Mm, unshare. Uh -huh. So that, that's what I have to say about the disadvantage for women's rights <clears throat> uh, here in this country. Uh, in the Southern Cone countries, Argentina and Chile, there have been massive marches now for several years. And uh, it seems that they will soon, it will soon be decriminalized there also, even though they're not progressive governments or pseudo progressive as we have here. Shall I ask for questions, concerns, complaints? I see uh, one comment saying that this is fantastic. Okay, I'd like to recommend, can you hear me? I can hear a woman's voice. Yes. I'd, I'd like to recommend this PBS documentary called Young Lakota. It's an independent lens and it's going to be available online for a few years only, but it was about the struggle on the uh, Rosebud Reservation for the, um, to elect a woman for the uh, chief of the, of the reservation. And so all the women campaigned for her and, and they wanted to get a women's clinic. And the men said that uh, they don't want abortions and they don't want birth control. They want um, as to many babies to be born as possible. And in the 1990s, when I was working on um, indigenous issues and a lot of um, native speakers like um, Dennis Banks and the guy from, you know, from Dance This Was Wolves, the line they all said was, uh, we're, we don't use birth control and because we have to make up for the genocide and I believe them. And then I saw this documentary and I was like, I believe them, but really the women, the Lakota women wanted women's health care. So it's a very powerful documentary about women's empowerment. And so it's on, it's on independent lens on the, on the internet and it was free to watch. And also there, I saw another PBS documentary 
called Fruits of Labor. And it was about a teenager whose mother was undocumented. So she could only get a job cleaning um, motels. And so to, to keep the, there was domestic violence. So the, um, the, the father left the family and she had, I think three children. So the daughter worked all night long in a strawberry um, processing plant and then went to high school, but she ended up still going to college. And so that is a wonderful documentary also about the things we're talking about. Fruits of labor, that's all. I just put in the, the chat a, uh, a link to Nevin's article, which wasn't particularly about the, the uh, situation with women's rights, but did you wanna give us a little uh, update on that? About the protests on the disappearances? Okay, well, I put together the other two topics Mark invited me to speak about in this presentation on uh, um, military issues, shall we say? <clears throat> That's uh, what happened in Ayotzinapa uh, is the second or third slide here. The articles that I wrote that you, thank you for having published last week or on these two issues, they're fairly closely related to each other. <clears throat> the first one I sent was that it was a surprise to me, the Zapatista army uh, declared that the state of Chiapas is on the verge of civil war. And the demonstration that they called was on, a, was on Friday, and two days later was the seventh anniversary of the 43 disappeared in, from Ayotzinapa. So uh, the protests very much coincided also. Um, <clears throat> Mark asked me to, a clip, which is quite reasonable, give some background on the Zapatista army. The Zapatista army of Na National Liberation, Zapatista National Liberation Army uh, came onto the world stage on January 1st of 1994. Of course, they had been active clandestinely for many years before among the Mayan people. Uh, that coincided with the first day they came into the North American Free Trade Alliance um, agreement came into force. Um, <clears throat> The EZLN uh, took, occupied, took over four counties, would be the equivalent of the United States, in the highlands of Chiapas. Uh, within a few years, they founded the good government, as opposed to the bad or evil government, uh, which rules the country and the rest of the localities. Mal gobierno was translates both as bad and evil. It's both those ideas together. Uh, at the end of that year, 1994, in December, the federal army, the national army was deployed, essentially tried to occupy those four counties and generally the state of Chiapas. And of course they had been active all year long and trying to be counterinsurgents from before. But uh, as I say, they had been successfully pretty clandestine up until January 1st. Now in December, just before Christmas, they, <clears throat> the federal government sent the army to very much occupy the country. They were not very successful. And a few weeks later, the first, the second weekend in January, about a half a million of us, probably much more, three quarters of a million people marched in the main boulevard in the here in Mexico City, in the Paseo de Reforma, and that stopped cold, all those movements. Within uh, another year and a half, by February of 1996, the president and the Zapatista armed a more or less, we could call it an armistice, uh, with many, many points that 
the federal government was going to recognize, except up until today, it remains unratified by the Congress. The San Andres Accords have never been ratified, have never been carried out. Sometimes they're uh, recognized to some extent, but uh, of course, non-intervention, not avoiding paramilitaries and so many other human rights have, uh, were promised and have yet to be carried through. Um, um, another massacre happened the next year. The one that Chenalo was uh, the name of the county. Actial is the, the town. That was, uh, that one was, there were 20 some victims that time. Again, it was around Christmas. So why did these things coincide with the holidays? Of course, low intensity warfare continues to the present day and so many other things. What happened these last few weeks? Um, <clears throat> why do they say that it's now on the border of civil war? If it's, if the San Andres Accords were never um, carried out, if there have always been dear disappearances, if there's always been kidnappings, if there's always been women killed, uh, feminicides, what's new and different? <clears throat> I did quite a bit of homework the last couple of weeks since published the articles. A couple of days ago, I spoke with Raul Romero, and it, a professor at the National University of Nam, and he explained that it's a constellation of factors or uh, a group of things. It's no one single event. <clears throat> only the one last one here on the list, only the most recent event of kidnapping two members of the leaders of one of the cooperatives <clears throat> was only one of the most recent events, but much more larger things than the ones I have here. There are new actors throughout the country, but particularly in the state, southern state of Chiapas, organized crime has changed. It's um, it moves around the country from year to year, from presidency to presidency. It's now located much more in Chiapas. <clears throat> Organized crime of all different types. Uh, it's, um, there's 27 different kinds of things that are broken and of organized, when organized crime is recognized as such. And all, most of these are now happening in Chiapas. From trafficking in arms, trafficking in drugs, trafficking in persons, money laundering, kidnappings, not occasionally, but the industry of kidnappings, doing it systematically over a long time. Illegal drugs are now harvested in Chiapas. They were harvested in other regions of the country. Uh, I remember when I lived in Columbus, the Acapulco gold, is from the state of Guerrero. This is now happening in Chiapas. Uh, <clears throat> not so much opium, but uh, marijuana and, and other things. And the stimulants that the other speaker was talking about are also now being manufactured there, not in the north of the country as before. Um, drugs were not from South, South America, have uh, traditionally been transported through other ports but are now going through Chiapas also, <clears throat> in addition to the Pacific and the Caribbean. Um, drug distribution, of course, has always been in the major cities and locally in tourist areas, To uh, but locally within the countries, this country consumes very little illegal drugs. Very few people consume them. And when they do, they're extremely poor quality. That's what's not exported, but the few crumbs left over. However, uh, Chiapas does not have preppy beaches like Cancun and Los Cabos. And yet, <clears throat> what tourism it does have is in the, well, highbrow type tourism. People go to San Cristobal de las Casas, which is a wonderful place of traditional cultures and Palenque, but this is a different kind of tourism. It's not weekends and uh, what do you call spring breakers not at all. And yet, drugs have now been distributed locally within Chiapas. Another important difference is there are now paramilitaries that are operating much more, much larger armies in a different way. Of course, they've always, uh, white guards, as we would say, have 
protected the um, plantations, the regular agriculture, the legal agriculture, legal harvests, but um, <clears throat> now they're uh, carrying out all these other things too that I've already mentioned. Also, Mexico is a major consumer of arms in the United States, and now Chiapas is too. This week's news, a financial newspaper has an, an article which they happen rather frequently, maybe every month. The cartels publish as much as 500 weapons a day, 500 handguns and rifles daily in the United States, in the border states of the United States, and bring them to Mexico. There's no what, vigilance of the border of importing things to the United States. You can bring whatever you want. There, there are no custom guards at all for coming in. <clears throat> there never have been. And also, the federal government and the state governments are also major publishers of purchasers of Israeli military hardware and Israeli military training, <clears throat> which has been a, a big change also um for it to happen in Chiapas. Another change is that Chiapas is now an entry point for immigration, not only from Central America, but also from the Caribbean. The Haitians and the Cubans that go across the Florida Straits are now also going to somewhere in Central America, I suppose Honduras or Nicaragua, and now coming through Chiapas. So the amount of migration has increased dramatically. You know about the, the Hondurans with their uh, motorized brigades, but now uh, from many other countries also. So and then, yeah. speaking so, of immigration, a yeah. major change is that it's sort of being privatized, the treatment of or handling of migration. These so-called evangelical churches are saving tens of thousands of immigrants from Central America and the Caribbean in these camps, and they're, but they're long-term, they can't stay. The immigrants come and these supposedly temporary camps are staying. <clears throat> it's another wall against immigration to the United States from Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, which has been done for a couple of years by the National Guard, by the body, not bricks and mortar, but the bodies of this new National Guard, and also the Army of God in Ejército de Dios and other um, <clears throat> evangelical churches. Can we include the Catholics too? The Catholics? Catholic the Church. Catholics. Yeah, I've had problems with them in the on the border. I've been there a couple of times. In the southern states of Chiapas and Guerrero and uh, in the states of Yucatan, the Catholic Church is not so popular, but rather the Protestant movements and churches have uh, <clears throat> taken on greater and greater roles and have been evangelizing for decades, but now are participating in uh, controlling migration also. And yeah, to my thousands. chagrin, Nevin, to my chagrin, the Presbyterian Church of Mexico is sucks. But anyways. <laughs> um, and this is, I talked about tens of thousands of people, but in this week's news, uh, uh, and a researcher, Donatio Guillén, calculated that if on average $10,000 is charged per migrant, each migrant pays the coyotes, the, the people, or the illegal traffickers of people. And if we multiply that by the monthly average of 10, excuse me, 100,000 people, the monthly average of 100,000 people come to the country, many of them do chop us. That's a billion dollars that goes to human trafficking every month. Billion in US counting. Um, the 
27,000 migrants have been detained in Chiapas last year. That's an incredible increase and it's 64% of all the detentions in the country. <clears throat> this has not happened before in the state of Chiapas. Moving on to the next topic, the new context. Um, the federal government, this particular administration elected in 2018, has its own favored mega projects. The famous Tren Maya, the Mayan train, and the train that goes from the Gulf to the Pacific, the Trans Isthmus Rail to compete with the Panama Canal. Um, when the United States liberated Panama from Colombia in the first year of the last century, uh, they were also continuing considering Nicaragua and also the uh, Tehuacan Isthmus. Now they're building a, a train in the Tehuacan Isthmus. The country has greatly been militarized this presidential period that started in 2018. No matter how much they deny it, the, the Secretary of Defense, uh, August 27th, uh, just a few weeks ago, said that now in Chiapas, uh, there are 10 uh, um, uh, guard stations in the state of Chiapas, and next year there will be six more. The state of Chiapas, in addition to the whole country, is being greatly militarized and is to control migration, the Secretary of Defense said. Um, <clears throat> Um, throughout the country, the feminicides are continuing to rise, the killings of women. It's uh, <clears throat> another point that uh, Mr. Uh, Gajardo said was that the traditional roles of family are changing. Uh, no longer are the strong men's uh, working both personally in the families, the patriarchy is breaking down, but also the organized political parties are in decline. Locally, there the traditional lines between the eternal pre and the what it muted into the PRD and one of its factions, the so-called Green Party, which is not affiliated with any of the international ecological parties, although it has a similar symbol to Pretty Tucan. That alliance is breaking down there also. On top of that, he says, he reports that the vaccination campaign is not working well there. Unlike the rest of the country where it's really respectable. I went to mine here in the city and got my free vaccinations and was treated quite well. Apparently there it's very disorganized and not taking care of the people. This group that kidnapped people, <clears throat> The two leaders of a cooperative uh, last month are from this group, its initials are OCAO. This paramilitary group has been around for a long time, uh, since the 80s, but it has transformed from a peasant group to a white guard. Um, so those are the changes in Chiapas. Now turning to Ayotzinapa, <clears throat> that is in the state of Guerrero, where Acapulco is the largest city. What happened there in 2014 was that 43 students of education, uh, teacher trainees, they took over uh, a bus at so often. Students often had to go to sporting events. They go and say, oh, we're going to go to the soccer game. Uh, we'll take over a, a bus and, and there we go and everybody has a good time. It also happens quite often to go to protests and, and it's almost traditional to when they wanted to come a week later to the annual protest about the uh, 1968 massacre in Tala de just a couple of weeks before the Olympics of 1968. At very least, the very conservative estimates were a thousand students were killed because they had been on uh, 
protests for nearly a year um, and escalations, escalations. Uh, the Polytechnical School and also the National University of UNAM, the Ethiopian and UNAM, uh, and UNAM were the most participated in 1968. At least a thousand of them lost their lives in October 2nd. When people here speak of 1968, they don't think of the Olympics. They think of the massacre then. And these students from IOC and Apple were coming to Mexico City to participate in the October 2 annual protest. But, but the local police got them, grabbed them, detained them at gunpoint, of course, nice, their standard rifles. <clears throat> but for some reason, within a few hours, they turned them over to the local drug dealers, the local drug traffickers, and the drug traffickers that evening is who disappeared the students. That, that evening of September 26, 2014. Ayotzinapa is famous. It comes to be, it, here within the country because in the 60s, uh, Lucio Cabañas and other people had the Party of the Poor, which was one of the many rebel groups at that time. So when we say Ayotzinapa, people's ears perk up, certainly. Um, students came into buses for the local, I said, and they drug tempers hand them over. Um, <clears throat> this, the people who were witnesses and participants in the abduction and the <clears throat> and others were the police, army, and others, those people were tortured when they were indicated in the coming years, in the subsequent years, 2015, 16, 17, 18. Uh, they've been tortured over and over again. They, they, the people who were suspected. The suspects have disappeared and so on and so forth. The news is there isn't any news. Only the remains of three of the 43 have been found. Two of those this summer. That's why Ayotzinapa was in the news. The current president, Lopez Obrador, one of his principal campaign promises was he would resolve it ever so quickly. Everybody knows who did it. We're still waiting. We're halfway through his six years presidency, still waiting. So Mark at, invited me to speak about, to mention what we can look for in coming, uh, in the coming weeks. <clears throat> um, of course, repression will in, in, increase both locally and nationally in Chiapas. Um, the so president of the Supreme Court this week said publicly in the news, Ayotzinapa is a government affair, a state affair. So something's going to happen for or against him, we can be sure. Um, since many people don't like to hear what I said about the, the uh, drug traffickers get 500 arms a day from the United States, here's the piece of news. Of course, it's in Spanish from a financial magazine, El Economista, Financial Daily. Something to watch out for a couple of days from now. October 12th <clears throat> for you is Columbus Day, being in Columbus, Ohio. Here it's Dia de la Raza, the people of the, the uh, merged peoples who uh, live here, and the National Indigenous Congress of most of the first peoples in this country was established 25 years ago. It's its anniversary. And it will also be the anniversary of the, shall I say, liberation of the National Institute of Indigenous Peoples, the government's uh, organization for taking care of taking care of indigenous peoples. That was also liberated a year ago. There will be some events this coming uh, Tuesday. If you would like to read the communiques from the Zapatista Army. They're in many European languages, as well as several indigenous languages. At this link, there's another organization. <clears throat> uh, you make your way by walking it. You make your road by walking it, Camino al Andar. And the specific information on the two people who were kidnapped were from this cooperative, AGMAQ, uh, Ajmak. Its network is in that link. Uh, thank you very much. And now as well.
Nevin, thank you, thank you very much, Nevin. And uh, so we, Esther, I don't know if you're still with us. I think you are. Um, what? Uh, thank you so much for being who you are, <laughs> first of all, and the the. Uh, the, the board, I'm not speaking for the board, but I am a board member of the Free Press with the Contemporary Institute for Contemporary Journalism, formally, that's what we are. And I like that concept. You know, what, what is contemporary journalism is not what to address current strong issues, challenging issues, ones that you know, have that screech on the, the chalkboard type of rea reaction, but we have to do them. We have to do them. Let us re always remember this, this today, October 9th, 2021, we're caught in between two very, very, very important historical events. October 7th, 2001, what happened? The start on the global war the global war on so-called terrorism. We're now into 20 years of it. We've ended Afghanistan, maybe. That's a whole other discussion we may have to have in the future and, and sort of really get into what that's all about. And then coming up, October 12th, 1992, 1991, Columbus's uh, psyche, arc psyche, free presses understanding started growing in 91-92. But in 1492 is when the day of the races happened. Invasion, etc. Uh, uh, total annihilation, whatever you want to say. So we're, we're squeezed in between those two historical reac reactions. You know, we're at, what is it, 500? and 29 year right next year will be 530 years of occupation talk about occupation in biblical senses people were sort of liberating themselves in about 400 450 you know if uh, years you know if you really want to get into bible stuff but anyways this is not that <laughs> um talk to me on sunday <laughs> uh thank you Nevin, uh, anybody, Esther, uh, I know you had some back and forth with some issues, and, and thank you. Uh, your, your, you're a member of a uh, select community in Columbus, Ohio, and, and as, as uh, several of your uh, past awardees have said tonight, is understand that is a great honor and and please don't we're not taking it to our head we just we want to know that you understand our history and we try to bring that today and that your work we must must support and must must honor so thank you for being our 2021 award winner of the Libby Gregory Award. And uh, that's October 2021. Uh, any final words, Madam, Madam? <laughs> <laughs> madam, Madam. I'm just gonna say we need to love one another. The greatest gift that God has given us to is to love each other and be each other's um, brother and sister's keeper. That's all. And thank you again, the Columbus Free Press. I love Bob. I love all of you guys. Um, you guys are amazing people. And thank you for allowing us to utilize the First Amendment. <laughs> Let's protect it, please. <laughs> and also write for your friendly Columbus Free Press newspaper, yes. okay? <laughs> we want people to write. So please have some of those sisters right please have them that that may be something that is just something please have you know i know Southside. 
the fun I sent you an, a text just in, privately but those Southside women they show when the COVID I don't know if the pimp I don't, again I don't know if the pimp pushed them to do it they got that hundred dollars straight to him I don't know but they all showed up and then that next two three days they had that arm up with the <laughs> with the uh, bandage on there I don't know if it meant something in within the business you know mm -hmm. but Southside I I've tried to connect a lot of the women work not live in the the housing project that's right next to my rec center so um i've got to know some of them pretty well and uh some have not ended well with their their experience like, like many of us we, i mean we i don't want to end negative but we need to understand that the, the challenge for justice i mean <laughs> esther you mentioned how you were missing Amber and uh, Ruben. Ruben. They were the only ones I trusted. Were very critical people into our community as well. So my concern always uh, is how to support people of color and being an organizer on the front line. It's a, it's a difficult motherfucking job. Sorry, Steven. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but it's it's a difficult reality.